So welcome to today's Religion Media Centre briefing, which is on the visit of the Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the moderator of the Church of Scotland to South Sudan. Their visit is described as a peace pilgrimage. They arrive on Friday and will spend three days meeting politicians, church leaders and people who suffered in the civil war and through flooding, which has wiped out homes and livelihoods and led to mass famine. We have a panel of guests who have explained the context and the hopes and ambitions for the visit. Um, and they include one of the um, people actually arriving in South Sudan on Friday, the moderator of the Church of Scotland, Dr. Ian Greenshills. So thank you for joining us, Ian. I hope your bags are packed, ready for your visit. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not that well organised. <laughs> So I suppose the first and most obvious question is, what connection does the Church of Scotland have with South Sudan? Why are you going? Going back uh, a few years now, the, the Church of Scotland moderator, uh, who was then Dr John Chalmers, visited South Sudan. Uh, and out of that visit, uh, there came uh, a, a desire on the part of many within the Presbyterian Church there uh, to go through a process of reconciliation and forgiveness uh, and to try to train people up uh, within the Presbyterian Church uh, to be facilitators in their own denomination for that. Um, there was another meeting then followed uh, with the Pope in Rome who met with uh, not just the church leaders but the political leaders as well. And it's been his expectation and desire to go back to South Sudan uh, and to have a pilgrimage of peace. Um, you, you mentioned various things that are going to happen. We are going to meet with um, our, our various different constituencies. Um, we're going to meet people who are very much on the edge uh, and beyond that even. But we're also going to be having a, a, a prayer uh, moment where we will have um, s several thousand people, probably up to about 50 or 60,000 people present. Um, and that will be uh, a crucial moment, I think, in the whole exercise. It will be all the churches coming together, along with uh, people from South Sudan. There are people who have been walking uh, now for many days to, to just be there. Um, and it will be that moment, I think, where we, we call upon God together uh, to help this young nation to find a way forward that is peaceable uh, and to encourage church, uh, to encourage community and to encourage leaders uh, to find that way together. But what role do you think the church leaders can play in the peace process? What progress can you make where others have failed? Well, I think it, it's evidentially just who's there. Um, this is historic uh, because it's the first time that the Pope and uh, what you might call reformed leaders uh, have worked together, have done something together since the Reformation. Uh, so that in itself is a, a huge statement. Um, it's, it's also indicative of uh, many of the things that are happening across the church in uh, the West at the moment. In Scotland, for example, we've just had the, the St. Margaret's Declaration, which is a declaration of friendship between the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of Scotland. Uh, we think that's the first time that something has happened of that ilk as well. And in what was a very sectarian uh, divide, uh, certainly one that I grew up in and uh, that the bishop, Archbishop who signed the document, uh, Leo Kishley, grew up in as well. And so we, we come with um, that sense of um, we're, we're together and we are trying to promote uh, by just our own experience and from our own experience that uh, people can be together and work together. And there is already within uh, the South Sudanese church um, a very uh, high degree of unity uh, amongst the Christians there anyway. So uh, it's... I suppose it's a visibility thing, but it's more than that. It's a spiritual thing too. Why is it the Church of Scotland, though, who represent uh, the the largely Presbyterian movement in South Sudan? Why are you in Scotland and no other leader? Well, curiously enough, it, it, the, the 
Our PC USA uh, folks are the folks who really have been the, the founders and uh, the, the, those who supported the church there. But the, the, the Presbyterian Church in South Sudan feel a strong connection with Scotland. Um, and it was us that they asked to be there um, and, and me as their representative. Um, and it's one of the oldest Presbyterian churches in the world, the Church of Scotland. Uh, one that has had a, a national vision uh, for the whole of its existence. And, and we are very honoured to be those who've been asked to come. And we, we spoke yesterday uh, to our folks uh, there, and, and they're absolutely delighted and see this as a very positive thing. Thank you very much. We'll turn now to Tom Delamar, if we may. CAFOD's Deputy Country Representative for South Sudan. And Tom, you've been um, dealing with the, the country and travelling over there frequently for many years now. So perhaps I can ask you about the way that this entire visit was instigated by Pope Francis after the visit to the Vatican of political leaders in 2019. Just take us back to that moment and tell us how the origin of this three-day historic uh, peace mission began. Thanks very much, Ruth, and uh, greetings from a very warm South Sudan, um, around 36 degrees here today. We look forward to welcoming you, uh, Reverend Ian, on, on, on Friday. Um, so, yeah, just to, to draw on, on the question you're asking there, Ruth, I think really um, the aim of this trip is linked uh, very much to the, the spiritual retreat that was in the Vatican um, back in 2019. So I think the, the aim for this trip is centred around peace and hope and to positively influence the peace process in country. Um, the peace process has continued since the since the 2018 agreement with some delays and extensions. Um, but I think now uh, this visit on uh, on Friday is looking uh, towards uh, peace and, 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 and looking to uh, further the process as we look for election towards elections in South Sudan in 2024. Um, so, yeah, in follow up to the, to the spiritual retreat in the Vatican in, in, in 2019 with the Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the, the former moderator of the Church of Scotland. Uh, this was, of course, uh, the, the coming together uh, of the leaders in the Vatican and um, where we saw the Pope kiss the feet of, of the of the president and the vice president of South Sudan. And um, this is a kind of follow up visit to that. And um, so we saw the Pope in his address to the leaders saying, you know, I ask you as a brother to remain in peace. Uh, there will be many problems, um, but do not be fearful, go forward and solve the problems. Uh, and also to, he ended his speech by saying, you know, disagreements will occur, but keep them in the office uh, and before the people hold hands. So I think we can see this trip as a kind of uh, a follow up um, to see if the homework that was set by the leaders there uh, has, been, has been taken forward and to see uh, the process um, in, in country. I think as well as that, though, just just to add, I think that there's, there, you know, there are other elements, key elements to this trip as well that are really important. So I think, you know, it is it, it's a pilgrimage of peace and it's in solidarity uh, with the people of South Sudan. There is a great deal of buzz about Juba at the moment. Uh, there's lots of banners, lots of preparations, uh, lots of chatter going uh, going on. And um, South Sudan is a predominantly uh, Christian country with a majority uh, Catholic population of, of Christians. And um, but it's not just Catholics or Christians who are excited. Um, I think that all people have faced uh, loss in some way or another. Um, and this trip is about the, the leaders uh, journeying in solidarity uh, with those who have uh, and are indeed still suffering. Um, it's about the closeness of the leaders uh, and about a reminder of their closeness to, to God uh, for the people of South Sudan. I did ask him a couple of uh, couple of colleagues, Satanese colleagues as well, what, what the trip would mean for them. And, and just to share a few messages there, um, they were saying that it, you know, it's a sign of hope and that the leaders have touched the hearts of the South Sudanese and that there is a need for peace and reconciliation as we approach elections and that we need lasting peace and no more war um, and also about being seen and recognised uh, on a global stage. Um, Tom, you go backwards and forwards, do you, between the UK and South Sudan all the time in your work? Um, can you just tell us something about the experiences of the people that you meet in the Catholic Church, the kind of lives that they've had over the last few years through civil war, famine and flooding? I'm based permanently here now in, a, in South Sudan, but indeed over the past sort of five or so years, I've been based in the UK as well. Um, and it's honestly a very uh, kind of humbling experience uh, with, the, with the communities um, that I've met. Um, the resilience um, that we've seen amongst communities in the face of, of some real challenges. Um, and I think some of those challenges are, are the ones that the leaders, the church leaders who are coming at, at the weekend um, are wanting, wanting to enter into. 
um, and that's evidenced by the fact that they're meeting with uh, internally displaced persons on, on Saturday. Um, so yeah, maybe just to touch on a few of the challenges um, that we've seen as well uh, in country. So, I mean, flooding uh, and droughts um, are huge across uh, South Sudan. Um, South Sudan is on the forefront, on the front line of climate change. Um, just as an example, um, for, to reference some of the communities that you were talking about there, I was in uh, Warap State in November, and um, I was speaking with, the, with some of the women in the community there, and they were saying we've lost many of our crops due to flooding. And um, they had their central communal garden still, um, but the, the crops that they planted elsewhere had been lost. Um, and just a, a few months earlier in the year, uh, in some of our programming in Lake State, some of the farmers were, were quite fearful that they wouldn't have enough water uh, for the crops to mature. And um, so I think um, the communities uh, that have contributed the least uh, to climate change are, are suffering um, the most. Um, but what we do see is a great deal of resilience amongst the communities. Um, we see them being adaptable. Um, and this is something that we're looking at in our programming as well this year. Uh, adapting practices so that we can uh, the communities can can continue in their in their resilience. We uh, had um, an interview um, at the Lambeth Conference last summer with it was an Anglican bishop, an Episcopalian uh, church bishop, um, who said that his cathedral was three foot underwater, and yeah. the whole of his province was underwater. This in twenty from twenty twenty, and there was no way that he thought that the water would escape. Is that typical of the stories that you've heard? Yeah, certainly. And, um, you know, from all of our programming that we do in South Sudan is through local partners, local organizations, often church organizations, um, and the, you know, the pictures and the reports that they share um, from different areas. And certainly when, when we go and visit um, the, the projects across the country, uh, we're seeing the exact sorts of flooding that you're talking about there, you know, higher than knee level, uh, higher even still, uh, families having to flee with very little um, from flooding, but also from, from, from conflict as well. Uh, just to mention uh, conflict as well as the driver of displacement and, and needs in country. Um, some of our programming in Upper Nile has been affected recently. Um, we, we saw families there who who'd planted, who, who were engaging in some of our agricultural programming. Uh, they then had to leave quite quickly. They settled elsewhere. They had to leave again, and now they're settled within um, within within Manakal town in, in Upper Nile as well. Um, so I think it's yeah, it, it, it's important to note the, uh, kind of the, the challenges that the people are facing, but also important to note. Um, the, the resilience um, and, and the work of, of organizations like ours in, in supporting those communities to face uh, and overcome the challenges that they're facing. Thank you. Can I bring in now Lucy Gillingham from Jesuit Missions, who's recently returned from South Sudan? I think you only returned last weekend, Lucy. I'm with Jesuit Missions, which is the international development organization of uh, the Jesuits, but one of my colleagues from Jesuit Refugee Service is on the call. Uh, we work with uh, organizations like Jesuit Refugee Service in country in South Sudan. Um, so I was there up in the north in Maban. I mean, a lot of the stuff Tom was saying, I experienced the same stories. I saw the same stuff. Maban um, up in the north experienced some of the worst flooding in almost 50 years, left millions of people displaced. And this, this happened in August, and we were there actually in November, and it looked like the flooding had just happened. Um, and, you know, the effects of the flooding are much bigger than people would see. For example, if lots of children were fishing. And you say, oh, that's nice. You know, the, the flooding has caused, has caused lots of fish to turn up. But then you realise they're using their mosquito nets um, to fish, which then makes people more vulnerable to, to malaria. What about the peace missions that you've yourself witnessed in, this, in the local parishes, that it's permeated down to a very local level to try to make change? Yeah, so the Jesuits are based in, in communities, um, in parishes, obviously they run several, they run lots of different stations across the country, uh, but one of the centres is in Rumbeck, in Lake State, which Tom mentioned, and through the parish, they have a multiple different peace building initiatives. For example, a youth congress every year that gets about 250 people, youth across from different parishes across the country, um, including, um, what else do they do? <laughs> Sorry, uh, they very practically, the parish provides a place for psychosocial support, um, you know, by the very presence of the Jesuits, as well as recreational space um, and places to learn vocational skill center on site to prevent idleness, which is a real worry um, in South Sudan that you have these youth coming up um, with no prospects. So this is a way of tackling that. Do we have anyone from the Episcopalian Church of South Sudan on? I'm just wondering if any of the names, um, uh, which which is a shame. Um, so I wonder, um, Dr. Greenshifts, if I could just ask you this question. 
Uh, this isn't about your own church, but about the Episcopalian Church in South Sudan and the place of the Archbishop of Canterbury there. Uh, there is disagreement amongst the bishop in, bishops in South Sudan with the stand that the Anglican Communion and the, the Church of England is taking on same-sex marriage. And I'm just wondering whether you've been involved in any of the discussions about the standing of the Archbishop of Canterbury with uh, the members of the Episcopal Church in South Sudan and whether he's still widely respected uh, enough to be able to take part in a process on their behalf. I can't answer the question uh, about another denomination. Uh, I know the Archbishop. Um, I've met him several times. Um, I think he's widely respected uh, throughout his denomination, but that's not a question I would be um, able to answer. Okay, it's worth putting anyway. Um, <laughs> I wonder, listening to the, the comments from um, uh, the, the, the people from, from CAFOD and then Jesuit Missions who have been in South Sudan recently, Dr Greenshields, whether you could um, give us any sign of your ambitions or hope as to what are the practical things you hope will come out of your visit? The difficulty is um, one of, uh, as we've just heard, you know, infrastructure that is uh, on its knees in many respects within the country. Uh, and uh, the fact that the poorest uh, are those who are the worst affected, and that always happens, doesn't it, in any situation. Um, I think we, we have to uh, try, and I'm sure the, the Pope especially uh, will have a, a very significant role in this respect as a, a national leader himself, um, of speaking to those in power in South Sudan uh, and trying to emphasise the, the grave need uh, for them as leaders to be those who are the ones who will make a difference in order to uh, release the kind of funding and help that will help the worst affected. But there's an issue there that Tom brought up that's uh, fundamentally important too. Here we're seeing the effect of climate change uh, and you know, it, it's this isn't just an issue for the South Sudanese leadership, uh, nor indeed for us, but it it re-emphasizes the, the fact that in a situation or in situations where you, you have the poorest in the world uh, and those who have least affected climate change, they're going to be the ones who are going to be most affected adversely by it. Uh, and uh, I just hope that that, that message um, resonates to some extent beyond uh, simply ourselves and the South Sudanese uh, to uh, those in other parts of the world who are articulating clearly a need for uh, this to be the number one priority as far as uh, governments uh, and politicians are concerned in every country in the world. The communities in South Sudan are on the forefront um, of climate change. It is you know, a key driver of displacement within the country, um, and it is a key uh, driver of food insecurity in the country as well. We're expected to see um, over 7 million people facing acute food insecurity needs in, in 2023, um, and also we're expected to see around 9.4 million people who will be need in, of humanitarian assistance, such as, as clean water, food, um, and support. Um, in, in the same year, in, in this year, 2023 as well. Uh, that figure is over 75% of the population. So I think it goes to show uh, just some of the scale uh, of needs um, in country um, as well. Um, so yes, I think it, you know, it, is, it, is, it is something that is a, a huge driver of needs um, a lot, along with conflict. And I think that it, it just underlines um, the, the, uh, the needs um, or, or the, the focus of this visit, um, but not just uh, this visit, also the follow-up um, work that will be carried out uh, by agencies by the church as well. Uh, maybe just to, to touch briefly on um, that the, uh, Reverend Green Shields was, was touching on as well uh, on kind of the role of the church as well uh, in South Sudan and engaging with key actors. And um, so South Sudan is a, a predominantly Christian country. It's hard to come by exact figures, but, um, but it's estimated the majority of the population is Christian and around 50% of the population Catholic. 
Um, so just to, just to, and when I speak here, I speak broadly of, of the uh, of all churches, and in particular the South Sudan Council of Churches, which is the ecumenical body, um, seven member churches in, in South Sudan. And um, they're, they're often respected by those on um, different sides of conflict, on all sides of conflict, which, which gives them uh, an ability to, to engage with communities and, and means that communities like ours can engage um, with our humanitarian development and peace building work. And um, we have, um, you know, from, from the from, from grassroots level, peace committees, uh, com uh, local groups that come together to seek non-violent resolution to conflict. Uh, we support partners to have um, uh, cattle uh, migration conferences where they can discuss kind of sharing of resources. Because of course, um, as we see, you know, an increase in, in, in climate change and challenges of climate change that reduces the availability of resources, which in turn can then be a driver of conflict. So it's kind of a, you know, a downward sort of spiral as well. Um, and on a national level, we support the, the South Sudan Council of Churches, uh, along with other agencies, um, to uh, in engaging with the peace process at, at the national level. Um, and you know, also to reference other other ways in which the church are engaging, there's the there's of course the the, the Rome Initiative, the the Santa Gidio, um, the Santa Gidio, uh, community, which are engaging those who are non signatories to the peace process and bringing them, uh, bringing uh, continuing the dialogue there. Um, and I think you know, with this ecumenical visit, there is a, a focus on the, on the commitment to uh, to the peace process, and 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 in summary, the church is, is able to, to you know to speak and um, to bring those who are in power around the table and and to speak um, across divisions, and that's a, a real kind of a special role um, of of the church in, in country. If there are any other questions, please do put them in the chat box. Just want to pick up what Jenny Brown has written here, that um, the FCDO cut aid to South Sudan by 59% in 2021. So the UK government, government can do a lot more, including by increasing aid for peace building and humanitarian relief. Would that be something, Lucy, perhaps bringing you in on this question, that uh, you would yourself campaign on? Yes, definitely. And um, funny enough, at Jesuit Missions, we do run uh, several campaigns throughout the year, including one last year um, about food, not fuel, um, encouraging the UK government to actually focus on uh, diverting some of the money they were spending on fuel to food aid um, in countries like South Sudan and Ethiopia, which are facing, um, as people have mentioned, incredible droughts and food shortages at the moment. So, yes, I think expect to see some more campaigns as well coming this year. Just a final question to you then, Dr. Greenshields, before we uh, wrap up for the day. Um, this is a historic, but it's billed as a historic visit involving three denominations. And I wonder if you see this as a template for future action by the churches um, in peace missions around the world, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the slogan better together makes sense uh, always. Um, I think that uh, it evidentially speaks to uh, the world in which we live and saying, well, look, these these are these Christians, they are together. Um, they're speaking with one voice. Um, that's That in itself is powerful. That's what Jesus would have wanted. That's what he asked of us. So the, there's, no, um, there's no conflict with that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, anything that, that brings us together, where we work together for the common good uh, of our neighbour, um, and of uh, one another, you, you can't argue uh, that that's not going to be positive and powerful. Thank you. And thank you to all our guests for uh, joining the panel today and everyone else for joining. Um, it's a shame that we didn't get the Episcopal Church of South Sudan involved, but communications fell down there. So um, and next time, perhaps afterwards. But thank you again for joining and do join us again for the next briefing. <laughs>